Good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. We still got a few minutes before service starts, but we're going to have prayer over here to my left, your right, over the Milan Hayes family and Brother Henry tonight. So all of our men and uh, young boys, if we could get our men and young boys in the prayer room and uh, those that can help us with that, come on in. You don't have to be a member here, and uh, but we want to pray and get in God's presence and spirit uh, before the service. So we invite you to join us.
evening. Welcome back to our evening worship service of second night of our revival or second service of our revival meeting. So thankful for what God did in our hearts this morning and are looking for him to bless again. We just stand with us, going to give you a couple opportunities to sing some congregational hymns here at the beginning. But before we turn it over to the Milan Hayes family at Calvary, if you want your hymnals 328 and uh, let's lift our voices together. We'll sing the first, the second and last verses. And uh, let's think about that day that he reached down and touched each and every one of us. song and let's just be careful to make it all about him tonight church amen and let's just ask him would you, would you ask him to speak to your heart personally and to come down and to do a work in your life that you need brother Walsh I'm going to ask if you will lead us and uh, then we'll sing our, our next congregational hymn Amen. As we remain standing, we love the old songs, and it's hard to improve upon one like we just sang at Calvary. But I'm thankful for the new songs coming out that are written with a scriptural basis by groups that are desiring to seek and to please the Lord. And this here is a great reminder that no matter what God accomplishes in our life, it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with Him. And church, I really want to see revival spirit, a revival wind will sweep through here, not just this week, but in this desperate hour we're living in. And we got to realize that that's going to happen. Yes, we have to be right with the Lord, but it's nothing we can bring. It's nothing this family can bring. It's nothing these preachers can bring, but it's something that the God I serve can send down. And if we'll realize it's not I, 
but it's him in me and he can do anything he wants to accomplish just sing these three verses together as we worship him prayerfully asking him to send a revival on our soul God to accomplish his perfect work in me and I want to get out of the way and get right in step with him and allow him to use us before we turn it over to the Milan Hayes family we want to worship the Lord again tonight in our giving and I want to challenge you you always do a great job uh, but I want to challenge you let's be generous and uh, let's give joyfully take care of our guests this week and this the Milan Hayes family and our preachers that are coming in with Joey driving up tomorrow and we want to be good to God's servants. I believe that's biblical. And uh, so let's all uh, do our part and be a blessing. I promise you, you can't outgive God. And uh, you just be faithful. And whatever this week he impresses upon your heart, sometimes it may not make sense on paper, but if God's impressed upon your heart, you do it. And you watch God take care of the rest. He's always faithful. So let's pray. And then tonight we'll start with sections 2 and 4. If you have an offering to bring, then sections 1 and 3. As uh, we give back to him just a portion of how he has so abundantly blessed each and every one of us. Brother James Price, would you lead us in his prayer?
Lord has made His mercy was new this morning. With every sunrise comes a chance to give Him all the glory. Magnify, testify, make a joyful noise. Celebrate His goodness with the mighty, mighty Yeah. 
for the love of God. Amen. This one talks about it right out of scripture. Continues that thought about the love of God. Every time I sit down to read from those holy pages. Stirred by the precious words that have stood through the ages. When my heart is sad and I feel alone, there is a promise that I can stand on. Paul wrote it down, and thank God I found it to be true. that he cannot hear us. And there is no mountain too steep or high that he cannot reach us. And when the end is drawing near, we still have hope that there's no need to 
to fear, no height or depth, no, not even death can keep us from Him. And nothing in the world can ever separate us from the love of God or His only Son, Jesus, no Quest for the boys to play the piano right over there. They're going to duel up on that thing tonight and do one called Moving Up to Glory Lane. <laughs>
many of you remember that old song right there? Moving up to glory land. I remember the cathedral, well, I don't remember hearing the cathedrals live, but uh, I've, we found that song on, uh, I've always heard that song my whole life. I grew up on Southern gospel music, so that song was a staple. And uh, so, you know, me and Connor, we play piano duets, and we were like, we need a new song. And we, we were running through old cathedral songs because we were like, they've got such great songs, but can, have, you, have any of them ever been done as a piano duet? And we ran across that one, and Connor looked at me, and he was like, we're going to do that one, whether you want to or not. So we decided on that. But I love the cathedrals, and we are so thankful to be here tonight. And I don't think we've ever been in Wilson, North Carolina. We've been up at uh, Greenville, North Carolina, um, to the People's Baptist Church, and that's where we met your pastor. And so we're so thankful for the first time to be in Wilson, and we're uh, glad that, aren't you thankful that we have uh, a co free country where we can wor uh, worship the Lord. I'm going to spit out the words here in a minute. Where we can worship the Lord freely on a Sunday night. And we can lift up our voices unashamed and tell him how much we love him. And share with the lost and dying world how much he loves them. And I grew up in a Christian home. And every day of my life I heard that Jesus loved me. And, you know, the very first song that they taught us when we were small was, Jesus loves me, this I know. The first Bible verse we learned was John 3.16. I'm sure some of you can relate with that. I'm sure you taught some of your grandkids or even your children those songs and those verses. But they have such truth in them because I think that I grew up, like I said, I grew up in a Christian home. But I think we can become so accustomed to hearing that Jesus loves us that we can almost forget how much he was really willing to go to because of his love for us. You know, we tend to think about how much he loves us, but we seem to forget sometimes that he was willing to go to an old rugged cross and to be beaten beyond recognition, further than any man should have ever been treated, but most of all because he was sinless. And he chose to go and die for our sins because he loved us. You know, the, the Bible, I was reading in Romans the other day, and Paul wrote where he said, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, but, you know, we may not even give our life for a righteous man, but God, while we were yet sinners, sent Christ to die for us. And I'm thankful that he loves us enough that he would have done it if you were the only one or I was the only one that needed saving. He loves you that much tonight. And um, this next song, it's got a simple title. It's called Jesus Loves You, and um, a friend of ours named Rodney Griffin, he sings with greater vision. You may be familiar with him. He's written a lot of songs. I'm sure your choir has sung or specials have been sung. Uh, he's a great friend of ours and a wonderful songwriter, and we were together in Louisiana with greater vision, and I got off the bus that morning and I, or that afternoon. I was walking in. We were getting ready to start the concert. And as I walked in, there was Rodney walking off of their bus at the same time. And he walks over and we started walking in together. And he grabbed me by the arm and he said, I've written this new song. And he said, you might just be the one that needs to sing it. And I told him that I'd love to hear it. So we walked into this back room of this little church. And for the first time, I heard this song, Jesus Loves You. And we fell in love with it instantly the minute we heard it. But I think what made us fall in love with it even more was the story behind it. He began to tell us how he had written this song. And he said, he, he lives in Kentucky. And he said, I was driving to Lowe's one day. He said, I live about an hour from Lowe's. And he said, I got on the interstates that afternoon. And he said, all the interstates were backed up. And he said, so I decided to take the back roads on the way home. And he said, so I found a county road. And he said, I knew it would wind up somewhere around my house. And he said, so I got off and I got on this little county road in Kentucky. And he said, as I drove home, he said, I got into one of those curves. And he said, up on the left-hand side was a little house. And he said, they didn't have, it wasn't a big house. He said, they didn't have a lot as far as the world is concerned. They, he said, to be honest with you, they lived across from the dump. He said, it was just a small house and they didn't have hardly anything. But he said, in front of that house was something that caught my attention. He said, it was a handmade, hand-painted sign that said, Jesus loves you in big, bright red letters. And he said, I thought as I drove by that, that that person may not have worldly goods, but they have Jesus and they want to share his love with the people that would drive by their little house. And he said, they have the most important thing if they have him. And he said, I thought about that person's faithfulness because he said it was obviously handmade. He said, so someone had to take the time to make that sign. And he said, it, you know, it's, it just showed that the Lord could put it on their heart and that he would, uh, that someone would paint that sign. And he said, it showed how much they cared for people and their souls. And he said, I thought about that all the way home as I drove. And he said, I called a writer friend when I got back and I told him about the sign, told him about what I thought. And he said, we ended up writing the song. And he said, whoever records this, 
I'm going to take the recorded copy and go back to that house and to walk up to the front door and to tell that person that because of their faithfulness and putting out something as simple as a sign that God allowed a songwriter to drive by it one afternoon. And he said, I wrote the song and he said, um, this song could reach into people's lives and touch people that this man will never meet. And he'll, it'll go to places that he'll never go. But he'll have rewards in heaven because he was faithful to put out the sign. He said he has a hand in whatever God chooses to do with the song. And he did just that. Long story short, we recorded it. The album comes out. We're singing with greater vision. And Rodney walks back up to the table and he picks up the album. And he said, I'm going to do it. And he drove back after that afternoon. And he, uh, we've actually got his picture right up here. He drove all the way back up to that man's house. And he said, I walked up and found this older gentleman sitting in a lawn chair reading his Bible that day. And he said, I walked up and introduced myself to him and told him about the sign and told him about the song. And he said, this man began to open up and tell me his life story. He said, when he was a young man, he said, I felt like I didn't have anything to offer the Lord. He said, I felt kind of useless. He said, I don't have any talent to go and sing. He said, I wasn't called to preach. He said, I'm just a common individual. But he said, one day I went to church and I was feeling that way. And he said, our pastor got up and said, be faithful in whatever it is that God calls you to do. Because God specializes in taking the small things and using them greatly for his kingdom and not ours. And he said, I thought about that. And he said, I went home and he said, my hobby is working with wood. And he said, the Lord touched my heart and said, you can make signs, can't you? And he said, I told the Lord that day. He said, I'll be faithful to do whatever you want me to do. And that was 25 years ago. And C.W. Gay is a faithful individual that lives on a county road in Kentucky. But he shares his faith boldly and proclaims it to the people that would drive by. And because of that, this song was written. I hope you enjoy it. It's called Jesus Loves Me. Driving down a county road. Kind of empty in someone's front yard, something caught my eye. Just a homemade painted sign that hung a little crooked. Three words in bright red against the white. And for another couple miles, I just shook my head and smiled Jesus loves you Jesus loves you someone unashamed living out their faith Jesus loves you he really really loves you like a gift of grace but in an unexpected place together that whispers you were worth the sacrifice and sometimes a simple note that's handwritten by a brother the soothing words speak peace into my life something stirs me deep a reminder that I need loves you, Jesus loves you, and someone unashamed, living out their faith, Jesus loves you, he really, really loves you, like a gift of grace, but in an unexpected place. church marquee, cause he can use the least of these to proclaim the truth we need. Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, someone unashamed. 
time ever hearing them. Praise the Lord. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew 7. Uh, it is a privilege and an honor to be here, Brother Jonathan and Wildwood Church. And uh, I've always loved your pastor and appreciated him. And we went to school together. And uh, it's becoming many, many years ago. And Lindsay as well. And uh, <laughs> did you hit the big 4-0 yet? Not yet? Oh, I hit the four, big 4-0 a couple months ago, and, uh, and uh, I'm uh, now realizing that 40 is not as old as I once thought it was, and so uh, now I'm looking to 50 and worried about that. But anyway, uh, Matthew chapter 7 today, and I'm just going to warn you, you know, uh, there's some people that uh, equate pastors to fast food restaurants, and you have your uh, Burger King pastors, you know, they're your way right away, you know. Um, I'm not one of those, by the way. Um, I equate myself to the windy type pastors, old-fashioned, hot and juicy. Amen? And uh, so just uh, let her rip, you know. And, uh, and so I, I want to preach to you something the Lord has really burdened my heart about. And uh, I've been able to preach on it in my own church. And just a burden that I have, I, I really feel like there's an epidemic going on in our churches that needs to be confronted. And uh, the, the issues that I have had as a pastor in over close to now 20 years, and what I realized what I was dealing with a lot of times are people who say they're saved, but they're not saved. They don't live like it. They don't act like it. They don't talk like it. And I believe Jesus deals with that here in Matthew chapter 7. And so tonight, in no way am I trying to confuse you. The Bible says to be sure of your salvation, and I hope that, that you will come to terms with whether you're saved or lost tonight. But I believe it's good to do some soul searching. And I believe, again, we are living in the days, and I believe these are the last days in which we live. The devil's doing all that he can to hinder the church. And I believe, just like my church, uh, not even an hour away, 30-some minutes away, the devil's doing all that he can. He's flooding our churches with wolves, and we need to be careful. We need to analyze our hearts tonight. And so tonight, I want to read Matthew chapter 7. The whole chapter would be good, but for sake of time, we want to read verse 21. The Bible says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven... Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and have we not cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? Now listen to this. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. In just a few moments here tonight, I want to preach a message I've entitled Confusion on conversion confusion on conversion let us pray father I, I pray now for your power I'm weak but you are strong Lord I give you my weakness tonight and in doing so I know when we are weak you are strong father I pray you'd speak through me as I've prayed now for weeks knowing I was going to be here I pray that you would speak through me. You would hide me behind the cross. 
I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified, you would be lifted up, that all men, women, boys, and girls would be drawn to you. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to those that may not know you tonight. Speak to those who, Lord, maybe have been playing church for several years. Lord, one thing's for sure. We need to get it straight whether we're with you or whether we're without you. And so, Lord, tonight I ask you be glorified. I ask you speak as only you can. Lord, I'll thank you for it. In Christ's name I do pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus here is summing up the Sermon on the Mount. He is preaching to a crowd of disciples about genuine Christianity here and what it really means to be saved. I believe with all my heart the confusion. Many people just don't know what it means to be truly born again. He's telling us the difference between a genuine profession and a false profession. I like what Jesus told Nicodemus there in John chapter 3. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, I'm going to be honest with you as a pastor and as a Christian. I have quit asking people, are they saved? I've quit asking because you know what I found? Everybody's saved. Now, you know I'm joke. I'm not being serious here. But you know, I see some heads shaking. You know exactly what I mean. We are living in days where everybody's going to heaven. Well, if you read up a few verses, you understand that Jesus said, Narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. Uh, broad is the way to destruction. There are many going that way. That's just a few verses above. But, so what I've started asking is, I said, are you born again? And if they scratch their head, you've got one. It's time to unload the gospel of Jesus Christ on them. Are you born again? To put it simply, many people who confess they know Christ and some may even be on our pews, some may even be in our membership in our churches, some may even be listening by internet waves or even here tonight. Some of the folks that are here and some of the folks on the internet land have never truly been born again. We need to think about this. They've not truly received Christ. They've not repented of their sins. By the way, one of the first words of the gospel, one of the first words of the ministry of Jesus, guess what it was? Repent. How often do we hear that in our pulpits today? Believe on Jesus. No, repent and believe. Amen. You see, here's the thing. Many people have not repented of their sin and truly placed their faith in Jesus Christ because had they did, their lives would have been changed. Their trees would have been full of fruit. Now, if you know your Bibles, you know that's uh, some of the verses above us there. Their desires and their directions would have changed. There's certainly a danger in our world and in our churches today I read this statistic and what's really, I really don't even want to know what this statistic would be today. But several, about three or four years ago, the statistic said four out of five Americans say they are Christian. Does our country look like that? Four out of five Americans say they're Christians yet do not seem to be bearing any fruit. Jesus said this in John chapter 15. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth not just fruit but much fruit. Jesus taught that salvation was a result of faith and repentance. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus also said the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. It is obvious if that statistic above that I've just mentioned were true, you would better believe here in America we should have been experiencing some type of revival. Well, I've got news for you. Unless you've got your head in the sands, you've, you've understood this real quickly. We are not in a state of revival. Our churches are cold. They're as cold as ice. I told my church this morning, I was preaching on something totally different, but I told them this morning, I said in some cases the cemetery is louder than the church house. The pulpit is, fire is extinguished. And we're saying that 
four out of every five Americans are saved? I don't believe that. I don't believe that and I believe standing on the authority of God's word we can honestly say that is not accurate. We're living in a day when everyone wants to be saved but not willing to live for him. Jesus tells us that you and I cannot serve two masters. You're either one or the other. Now what was there even further more interesting of that statistic it said only 18% of them claim to be totally committed I have a problem with that math. Let me correct myself. The Lord has a problem with that math. The Bible has a problem with that math. The bottom line this evening is, is, is being a Christian is not just a label we put on ourselves, but a decision to allow Jesus to be Lord of not just half our life, our entire life. Tonight I would like to allow Jesus, if you will, to correct our world and our churches on this biblically. I'd like for Jesus to straighten this confusion on conversion out for us this evening. So I want you to notice first of all there's a false profession going on. There's a false profession. Look there in verse 21. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. So there's a false profession. He says, Not everybody that cries to me, Lord, Lord, now, I want you to understand the meaning, and I have to share this a lot of times as a pastor, and when I share the gospel, you know, it's the Lord. We confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. We still believe in lordship salvation, amen? We don't just pray to Jesus. We pray to the Lord Jesus. When you come to know Christ, in essence, you are confessing to him. You're saying, Lord, I am wrong. You are right. I invite you into my life. Oh, Lord, take control of my life. You are my boss. You are my master. You are my ruler. You are my owner. You are the one in authority. By the way, if you read the Greek dictionary beside the word Lord, all those are in that definition of Lord. You are the one in authority over my life. You are the ruler. You are the boss. You are the, you are the, you are the one who sets my marching orders. You, and it literally said most important. Now I'm going to be honest with you. That is not four out of every five Americans. Let me take it a little bit further. That's not a lot of folks in our churches. You know what scares me? I read a statistic. And I really was taken back by it. How many of you remember Adrian Rogers? Somebody had said that before he had died, he made a statement that he believed that only 20% of folks who say they are saved are actually saved. Now, I, I don't know if I, I mean, I, I was finding that hard to believe, but I'm going to be honest with you, after several years of pastoring, I'm starting to agree with him. From the things I've seen and the things I've experienced, I have to wonder, are the people that I'm dealing with and the people that were ministered, are they truly ever, have they ever truly been saved and converted and transformed by the power of the gospel? Do we still believe in Romans chapter 1? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. When that power comes into contact with sinful man and it takes root into one's life, there will be a change. It's really the point here being made. These people called Jesus Lord with their mouth, but they denied him with their life. Their walk did not line up with their talk. Jesus puts it this way in a parallel passage in the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Why do you call me Lord? And I'm telling you, as a pastor, I'm dealing with case after case after case. And I'll be honest with you, some folks are backslidden, but let me tell you, there's a lot of folks that I wonder. Now, I'm not the judge, but by the way, there's nothing wrong with doing a little fruit inspecting. Jesus even says, by their fruit you shall know them. There's nothing wrong with that. But we're dealing with people that I believe their number one problem is they just need to get saved. Because if they'll get saved, Jesus will take care of the rest of it. Jesus points in this verse, uh, his point is how can you claim him as Lord and not live like it? 
Many church people and worldly people claim they know Jesus, but their life does not show it. Prove it, preacher. Just look at their schedule. Just look at their passions and desires. We'll, we'll spend hours talking about Carolina, amen? I'm a Carolina fan. I went in the food line the other day. I had my Carolina shirt on. I had my Carolina hat on. Me and another young fella at church, we were buying drinks for our homecoming. And, and uh, the old, old guy come up there to me. He said, yeah, yeah. Boy, we got a good team this year. I said, you know what? It's great. To, for years, I denied we even had a football team. It's great just to admit we have a football team finally. And there's nothing wrong with, with being a, a fanatic on sports, but folks, we are living in a day where, where and I'm talking about people who sitting on our pews can tell you more about Carolina basketball than they can about this book I hold in my hand. We can tell you about all the positions the players play in, but we don't even know the books of the Bible in order. We can't quote one iota of scripture, but maybe Jesus wept. John 3.16 even sinners know those. But just look at our passions and our desires. Look at our priorities. I, I'm just going to say this. I don't believe you should have to browbeat nobody to come into God's house if they say they're saved. But I am finding more and more as a pastor, I'm thinking, I told my wife today going home, I said, honey, I just think they need to get saved. And I'm going to be honest with you, some of them have been gasping at breath because I've changed my tactic as a pastor. I've just come around and ask them, are you truly saved? And they're, so I'm just looking at your tree. Jesus said, by the fruit you'll know them. Look at your priorities, look at your passions. Well, we'll, we'll come if there ain't nothing else going on. They don't tell me that, but that's the way they live. If there ain't a ball game, if little Johnny ain't got a travel ball game, we'll, we'll be in church. Mm. I'm telling you, if you love Jesus and he's your Lord, he said forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. That means he comes first. He is the Lord. He is King of kings. He is the one in authority. And my goodness, as Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will be in the house of the Lord. Look at their priorities. Jesus is way down on the bottom shelf. And we wonder why families just like that, sins intruding in and destroying homes one by one, and there's no priority. No priority of God. Look at their language. <laughs> I had a I had a, as somebody in leadership, you, you know what I'm talking about, inheriting things when you come to places. And I always wondered about this particular individual. And I'm telling you, this is a good thing because be sure your sin will find you out. No longer on leadership, praise God. But he, he was on this backwater YouTube channel, one of our church members, one of our teenagers. Saw brother so-and-so, brother so and so right in the road with another guy cussing up a storm like he was a sailor now my wife's mouth dropped but mine didn't because I had already seen some fruit on that tree I didn't see anything it was barren but look at our language the way we talk look if we know Jesus he's going to infiltrate more than our heart our tongues also if we're abiding in the vine, like John 15 tells us, then hey, we're, we're going to see some product. We're going to see some evidence of that. Just look at their home. Look at their schedule. Look at their passion and desires. Look at their priorities. Look at their language. Look at their home. Just look at how they treat the house of God and the things of God. I'll never forget a, 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 a man came to me several years ago at Belvoir. He said, my children are a mess. I don't know what to do. I don't know. And, I, and I, I was just as, my wife tells me I have a way of being so brazen. <laughs> and I say, Lord, give me tact. That's a prayer I pray every day. Lord, just give me tact. Help me to say what I need to say in the right way. 
And I just told him, I said, you never prioritize the house of God. I'm willing to bet prayer and Bible reading was not a constant in your home with your kids because of the way you treated the house of God. By the way, I can tell a lot about your relationship by how you treat the house of God. And I said, now you're sitting back and you're, you're seeing the results of that. The way of the transgressor is hard. Just look at their actions. Look at their fruit. We can go on and on tonight. But these things reveal who your Lord truly is. As Jesus says, how can we call him Lord and Savior and not live and do as he has said? A false profession. In our churches tonight, there are people who call him Lord, but their life tells a different story. Jesus moves on to verse 21, or continuing down verse 21, a fruitless life. So there's a false profession, but then there's a fruitless life. Look here in verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter, uh, shall enter, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Notice here the phrase, but he that doeth. But he that doeth Jesus is explaining the difference between a false profession and a genuine profession. True faith will not fail to produce good works. This is precisely the point in James chapter 1. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And James continues in chapter 2. He tells us, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You see, James is basically saying the same thing that our Lord is saying here in Matthew chapter 7. I, and I had some people look at me and they say, Preacher, you believe in a work salvation. No, no, no. You've missed it if that's what you're thinking tonight. That's not what Jesus is saying here. Folks, understand, the Bible does not teach, never will teach a work salvation, but it does teach a salvation that works. The Bible does not teach a work salvation. There's nothing you and I can do in and of ourselves to go to heaven. It is only through Jesus. Only Jesus can save us. However... The Bible does teach in a salvation that works. There will be seeable fruit in the life of a true Christian. As Jesus said in verse 20, By their fruits you shall know them. I love 2 Corinthians 5.17. I want it put on my tombstone. I quote it so much. <laughs> Therefore, if a man be in Christ, y'all know it, he is a what? New creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The Bible lets us know that when we come to know Christ, we become a new person. We have new desires. We have a new direction. We have a new language. We have a new walk. Do we still believe that tonight, church? I'm asking you tonight, in your faith in Christ, is there fruit? Is there enough evidence in a court of law to convict you as a Christian? By the way you talk, the way you live. How about your relationship with the Lord? You see, it's not a prayer, it's a relationship. Thirdly, let's look at a faulty understanding. A faulty understanding tonight. <clears throat> there's a false profession, there's a fruitless life. There's a faulty understanding. Look at verse 22. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord... Have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? A faulty understanding. And really, people say the Bible's not relative. It is really relative to this day because this is where we're living. People equate their church membership, and they equate their good deeds, and they equate a prayer they prayed at VBS when they were five or six or seven years old. And they say, I'm good. There's a faulty understanding in our churches, in our world today. Jesus confronts it here. These people believe that their salvation is in something that they do. Even though they may have done it in Jesus' name, does not merit eternal salvation salvation these type of people I've tried to picture these types of people in our climate today these type of people are what we would call good old boys and girls 
We had a young man about eight years ago visit our church. He came in. He comes from a good family. They're good, hardworking, young. Man, I was impressed because he came in the door, called me, yes, sir, no, sir. Uh, you know, and he was in, about 17, 18 years old. And he come chasing a girl in our church, which I don't like that either. Don't trust me. I, our people know I don't like boyfriends and girlfriends. I just don't like them. They, have, they, they start on the wrong foot. But uh, he, he came running in there, and, and I preached that day. He'd been going to a Baptist church with his family down the road in Tarboro, never heard the gospel. Thought he was okay. Well, he got, he got put in the right place and he heard the gospel. He ran to our associate pastor of church and was gloriously and wonderfully saved and his life has transformed. His life has changed he was a good boy. But let me tell you tonight, there will be good boys and good girls in hell. You understand when the Bible says good, it means morally perfect. It, it's not the idea. We, we look at good as, it, it's good. You know, but Jesus, there's nobody that is perfect. And that's why we need Jesus. Matthew that day as he sat in the pew, God began to deal with his heart. He realized that he didn't have Jesus. He had a faulty understanding. These type people may even go to church and even be a member of churches. You know what? I've discovered there are people in our role that just ain't saved. I had a lady in our church a long time ago. She got mad at me because I, I said, uh, our Sunday school teachers are going to be faithful to church. Little Johnny's going to see their Sunday school teacher on Wednesday night, Sunday night. Gave them two years. I don't know many pastors that would give them two years to comply to this new thing. But I did as God directed me. And that two-year mark, never heard a word. But then, buddy, it was like the moose was loose in the field. I need you to come talk to me, pastor. So I went to the house. And all she could talk about is how her daddy built the church. And he did this and he did that. And I said, oh, praise God for faithful men of the past. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about your faithfulness. And I'm going to be honest with you. The only thing she has to go on, and I've never, I've never seen one iota of fruit on her tree. But because they're a member and because mama and daddy built the church and because they have all this pedigree of things, they think they have a, they have a faulty understanding of salvation. And my fear is as a pastor is there are many people sitting in the pews that I preach to and, the, and all over America there are people sitting in pews having a faulty understanding. They are unsaved. They are unregenerate. They, they are on their way to a devil's hell because they don't have Jesus. They've never come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ he's not transformed their life because they've never cried out to him these type people are people who've grown up in church they trust their own goodness their titles their warped idea of God and his word I'm thinking of, a, of an individual right now and, I, and this is a true story y'all He was in leadership as well. I know y'all think I come from a heathen place. <laughs> I want you to know something. The Lord has blessed our church. But I had problem after problem. I told my wife, I said, I just don't believe this individual's saved. Throwing rocks at fellow brothers and sisters and always had a problem, always mean and mean as a rattlesnake. People wouldn't even want to sit on his side of the church. They're so scared of him has a problem with one of our deacons and, and man, he's just going off. And one day he said something he shouldn't have said. Well, I'm going to tell you something as a pastor. I don't mess around. People know at my church if, if something goes wrong, I'm actually on your doorstep right after service. That's the way I handle it. Best way to extinguish fires when they're small. And so I walked in there after church. I said, honey, I'll meet you at the Mexican restaurant. I got to go to so-and-so's house. I went in there and there he was all bittered up. Brother, so and so, blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, come on, let's go. Where are we going? We're going to Brother So and so's house. Oh, no, no, I didn't want to do that. But countless problems over the years, it finally came to a head, and I just I was coming to the conclusion this man just ain't saved. 
And I, I looked at him one night and he was in the foyer of our church talking about that brother in front of God and everybody. And that morning our church had sung in a choir, loving God and loving each other. Now my deacons say I have an Andy Griffith way of dealing with things. It started in my feet and it works its way up, you know. And he's in the foyer. I said, this, is, this ain't happening. So I got up to him and I said, you need to love your brothers and sisters. And then I broke out in chorus. Loving God, loving each other. Now in my church, everybody knows Pastor Henry don't sing, okay? I want to keep people in my church so I don't sing. So I'm in the foyer, people are coming into Sunday night church and they're hearing the pastor and all of a sudden folks are stopping. They're like, what is he doing? And while I'm singing, this guy, is, he is red in the face, he is hollering and he gets louder. So I get louder. Loving God, loving each other. So he gets louder, I get louder. By this time I had a crowd of deacons standing over there watching. They, if they had a bag of popcorn, I'm sure they would have been entertained. Loving God. And about that time, he stomps out the door. He walks out the door. And y'all, y'all have to understand, I was getting ready to preach. I looked over at the deacons. And I looked over. Everybody staring at me in the foyer. I said, we can have church now. The devil's gone. And that family, I know you're probably shocked. They left the church. But I want you to know something. When they left, Maybe a year or so after, we started seeing people get saved. We started seeing, we had over 30 people come and give their life to Christ. We, we saw growth. We, we came to a point after COVID where there was more baby Christians than there were solid Christians. We had a spiritual nursery. And what I'm trying to get at tonight is I believe that there, the devil is working overtime. There are people in our church who are unregenerate and all they do is stand in the way of God. I'm telling you tonight, don't stand in the way of God. Give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Allow, allow him to change your life. Don't be a problem. Get on board the gospel ship and sell on. We've got a lot of people with a faulty understanding. What does Jesus say? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except you be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And what I believe tonight, there's a lot of folks sitting in our pews, maybe even some folks here tonight, you've just never been born again. It's not the things we do that save us. It's not our good deeds. Salvation is not in something we do. It is only found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I want you to understand, I was reading this one day, and the Lord brought it to my attention. Do you know there has never been a self-made Christian? You're Jesus made, or you're not made at all. <laughs> Follow me, and I will make you fishers. What we need tonight in the church house is some people just to get real with God and has Jesus made me? Am I in the vine tonight? How's my fruit? And finally tonight there's the future judgment. Look at verse 23. This, these people with the faulty understanding and the fruitless life and the false profession. Look at verse 23. And then will I profess unto you them I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I want you to see this here. They're going to stand before Jesus and give an account of their lives. It could be you tonight. These people failed to be ready for the judgment. Notice what the judge says about them. He says, number one, I, have, I never knew you. Now it's very interesting because the word knew in the Greek literally implies an intimate relationship is what I was talking about earlier. These people did not have salvation because they did not have a relationship. The problem is there are people that are coming or riding on a prayer and not on a relationship. Salvation is a relationship with Jesus. I'm asking you, how much time do you spend talking to him? I ain't talking about, is, is the only time you open this book when you come into this sanctuary? I hope not. 
Look, I got a wonderful wife and I love her. We've been married over 12 years. And you know what I've discovered? That if I sit in the back room of my whole marriage and not talk to her, it ain't going to go very well. You see, a relationship takes two people. You know what I feel? The reason why sometimes we're not, we're not in our Bibles and we're not walking with God like we should because we've never been born again. Relationship. You see, Jesus said, I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. You never walked with me. You never talked with me. You don't know me. I don't know you. I never knew you. There was no walking. There was no talking with Jesus in their life. They were trusting in a vain prayer and good works to get them to heaven. Notice what else he says about them. Ye that work, what? Iniquity. Literally, ye that are always working iniquity. It speaks of their lifestyle. These people said they knew God, but they lived continuously in sin. The mark of a true Christian is obedience. What did Jesus say in John 14, 15? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The mark of a true Christian is obedience. I don't give you a penny for somebody who's come down to an altar and prayed a prayer and they leave and they never come back. And their life does, that's not salvation. That's not being born again. Romans 6, 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but ye obeyed that from the heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. You see that? He's saying you changed. The gospel, the power of God unto salvation changed your life. And what I want to ask you tonight, has God changed your life? Has God changed your speech? Has God changed your walk? Are you truly saved? Do you know him? I didn't say you were going to be perfect. I'm not perfect. Just ask my wife. I haven't arrived, but I'm striving. You know what I've discovered? There's a lot of Christians, they just ain't striving. Do you truly know him today? Does your life bear the fruit of a true Christian? And I've got to be quiet here, but the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, look again, just a few verses above. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and what? Cast into the fire. Wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. I want to say this tonight. You do not want to hear, depart from me. You say, preacher, you mean to tell me there's people sitting on our Free Will Baptist Church pews tonight that are going to split hell wide open? Yes. And they will hear these words. Could it be you tonight? Is there some things in your relationship with God that you need to settle? Do you know him tonight as he changed your life? Look at what Jesus says. Here's how do we respond. So how do we respond? Look at verses 24 through 27. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon the rock. I ask you tonight, are you founded on the rock of Christ? And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. May I submit to you, we're seeing this before our very eyes in our churches. You're either on the rock or you're on the sand. By the way, the Lord brought this to me one day in reading this passage. Do you know the wind blew on both? And I've seen when people get saved, the devil likes to stir and the wind blows. I've got a lady in my church right now. She's been gloriously and wonderfully saved for about nine years now. Matter of fact, each one of her children have been getting saved. And it's great to see the, the gospel go through her family. The wind has blown in her life. But she stayed true. You want to know why? Because she's built her faith upon the rock of Jesus Christ. I ask you tonight, where are you building? I'll leave you with this story. I'd done a funeral yesterday for a man by the name of Billy Robertson. About eight years ago, I was called, my, my, one of my deacons, Sammy Everett, had called me and 
he said, preacher, my uncle is, is going to have a lung transplant, and they're not sure whether he's going to make it through this. And he's been talking a lot about salvation. I've been trying to share what I can. And he says, preacher, would you drive down to Aden with me? Live over there by Skylight Inn. And I said, yeah, sure, I'll go down there. I thought we'd never get there. I pulled up, and there he was in the trailer. He was already eating table, ready for the meeting. Had his Bible out, had the lights open, lights on. We walked to the table, and I began to share the gospel with him. I believe this with all my heart before we bowed our heads to pray. I believe he was already saved. <laughs> Gloriously and wonderfully saved. You never wonder when you witness to somebody, you ever wonder, and it's somebody you won't have much contact with, and you know, you, you wonder if, it, if they got it. I, I got him in contact with a church right down the road, a Free Will Baptist church, and he started going attending there. He had the lung transplant. He had several brushes with death. And through the years, I kind of kept up with him here and there enough to know he was being faithful to his church and the Lord was doing things. And all of a sudden, I got a call out of the blue last week. Preacher, it was Brother Sammy, my deacon. He said, he, he, he wants to see you. He's in the hospital. He's not doing well. So I'm thinking in my mind as a pastor, what would you think? He's probably wanting assurance of his salvation. So I go in there and I open the door. And look, he, he, he's right there ready. He looks at me. He says, come here. In a hurry. Like he's rushing me over to his seat. And I'm thinking, what's going on? He says, I'm getting ready to leave this world. I said, what? what? I, thought he was, I thought he was out of his mind. I actually called the, my deacon afterwards. I said, is he in his right mind? Yeah. He, he says, I, I don't think I'm going to make it out of the prayer. Could you, let's pray. I said, well, brother, I said, is everything well between you? I said, do you know? He said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, eight years ago in my home, I nailed down that Jesus was my Savior. And I want you to know that I love him. He died for me. He, he started giving me the gospel. <laughs> and he says, I haven't faltered. I haven't budged. He says, I'm not perfect. But praise God, he's been faithful to me. And I just wanted to make sure you'd handle my funeral services. He said, my pastor's going to assist, but you led me to the Lord and I, I want you to be a part of my home-going celebration. And I walked away thinking, only God, only God's salvation, only the salvation that comes through the blood of Jesus can cause you to look death square in the face and say, praise God, I'm going home. That's the kind of salvation I'm talking about tonight. You can stare death right in the face and not be worried. You see, he built his house on the rock. I found out yesterday from his pastor, he said, Henry, he sat about third row. And he praised and gave testimony every service. He loved the Lord. And he lived like it. You see, that's the kind of salvation I'm talking about that changes lives. I'm asking you tonight, are you building on the rock or are you building on the sand tonight? With every head bowed and every eye closed tonight. I don't know where you are. I don't know what the Lord has spoken to your heart about tonight. I, I'm well aware that you could be saved. But maybe God has spoken to your heart about some areas in your life. You know, the Bible warns us about drifting. But maybe tonight you're here and maybe you've been playing church. Maybe, maybe you started doing some fruit inspecting in your life there in the pew and maybe God's spoken to you and said, hey, you've never been born again. And what a